So you already talked about you exist, one of the five universal laws that Bashar yes. talks about. What yes. are the other four? Could you tell them all to me in one sentence? Absolutely. <clears throat> he says that the laws, what he calls the five laws, are the basic description of the structure of existence. So number one is you exist. There's nothing you can do to change that. You can change your form, but you cannot change the fact that you exist. The reason for that, very stupidly simply, is you can't become non-existent because by definition, non-existence doesn't exist. That's its definition, to not exist. Therefore, that which does exist just exists. That's its quality and cannot become that which doesn't exist because there's no such thing as non-existence by definition. So that's number one. Number two is everything is here and now, which basically means space and time are an illusion, a projection of our consciousness. Everything actually exists all at once. It's all accessible right here. You just have to change your frequency in order to access it because that's how they're separated. They're separated by frequency. Just in the same way that TV programs are separated by frequency, even though they may all be running at the same time. Uh, number three is the one is the all, the all are the one, <clears throat> which means there is only one thing and everything that seems different is made out of that one thing because there's nothing else to make anything from. Number four is what you put out is what you get back. Sometimes people on earth translate this as the law of attraction. And <clears throat> something important to say about that because even though it's not incorrect to say that, well, you have to be the vibration of a thing to attract it. The idea of the way it's usually stated here is, in my opinion, incomplete. And people are left thinking, I have to learn what that vibration is to attract the things that I need in life. That I disagree with. You are already giving off the vibration because that's your natural core vibration is to attract what you need in life. If those things aren't manifesting, it's not because you're not the vibration of the attraction. It's that you are blocking them from coming. You're stopping the vibration from bringing them to you with negative and fear-based beliefs. So it's not an issue of having to learn to attract. It's an issue of having to learn to stop blocking what you're attracting naturally. And law number five is everything changes except the laws. Those are the structure that don't change. But everything else changes. Perspective, experience, beliefs, it all changes and it's changing constantly. Um, Bashar has even gone so far as to say that the way we actually even experience the concept of time is by actually shifting our consciousness through billions, literally billions of parallel realities every second. So we're constantly shifting like a projector light through a series of film frames to create the illusion of movement and change on our screen, our movie screen of reality. So if you understand that you're flickering through these billions of frames, then everything is changing constantly and every single moment is a different frame. When you really start to wrap your mind around the fact that that's how reality is being generated by your consciousness, then you know that every moment you're actually going back to zero and that this sense of continuity from the past to the present to the future is also part of the illusion. You can break your continuity by understanding that you're shifting all the time. So you don't have to learn to shift. You are learning to navigate what frames you're shifting through that are more and more representative of the frames and the realities you prefer. And do my feelings help me <clears throat> navigate that? Yes, because your feelings tell you what you believe to be true. And what you believe to be true creates the vibration that navigates you. And what about timelines then? What do timelines come into play? Timelines are kind of what I just described, but yeah. see, okay, it gets a little bit, <laughs> we're going into fourth dimensional physics and higher physics here. When I describe parallel realities as frames, <clears throat> each frame, like a frame on a film strip, has no movement in it, no awareness in it. To create that illusion, you have to go through several frames. That's a timeline. But each parallel reality is nothing but a frozen snapshot. We call timelines parallel realities. That's why it gets a little confusing because we're looking at the entire experience over time and saying, well, that's a parallel reality. But the, the seed of the parallel reality is a frozen frame with no experience in it whatsoever. Just like on a film strip, you just look at a frozen snapshot, you don't know what's going on. You have to see the next one and the next one and the next one to get a sense of story, to get a sense of movement, to get a sense of where that's going and where it came from. So that's what creates a timeline, is a series of parallel reality snapshots viewed through a perspective of continuity that connects them together. But 
in truth, the mechanism is telling us that every single moment is a new frame. <clears throat> and if you decide that you want a different frame in that moment, you are jumping to another film strip. And that means, strangely enough, that not only are you changing your present, you're changing your past. Because if you look at it from the space-time concept of continuity, if you change who you are as a person in the present, in a sense, you had to have had a different past to have become that person. That's the way it works in physical reality. So when you change your present, you are actually changing your past as well. You have a different history. Now, you may create it so that you don't remember another history, or you can create it so that you might actually have hints of the history that you used to have before you changed. This is starting to show some of the breakdown in space and time. I'm not saying this is always the case, but some people have recognized this as a phenomenon that they have referred to as the Mandela effect, where some people are remembering a different situation than others who shared the situation with them. And they're both right. They both have a completely different memory, aside from the fact that sometimes we just don't remember things. That's true too. But in some cases, people are very, very clear that they remember something in a certain way and others are very clear that they remember it completely differently and both are true because both are representative of different parallel pasts. Yet they're still agreeing to share a common present, but have the difference of view. So they remember a different past line before they agree to create this present together. So these kinds of things show the flexibility and breakdown of time and space in our consciousness as we become more aware that we are these multidimensional beings shoving ourselves down into a box to pretend that we're not. But that box is now leaking. And so we're starting to get glimpses of the parallel realities we're using to create the timelines we experience and how we can have more autonomous conscious control over which frames we actually experience from this point forward. This sort of <clears throat> condensed energy mm -hmm. soup thing that we live in. Yes. Do you think that it's, it is starting to burst open because yeah. we're on the sort of verge of the spiritual awakening? For those who are taking that path, yes. For those who are not, no. <laughs> it will still remain and probably become even denser because you can have many choices. So we're going to still be able to see for a while that there are people choosing things that are not necessarily the realities we would choose. And that's okay. Just because you can see and observe them doesn't mean they affect you. Bashar's kind of used this analogy of saying, look, things are kind of splitting apart into different parallel tracks right now. <clears throat> and it's almost like there are glass walls in between the different realities. So you can still see what other people are choosing, but they can't reach you with their ideas. Their vibrations bounce off those glass walls back to them. Your vibrations bounce off the glass walls back to you. So even though you can look like you're sharing the same reality, you're not anymore. Things are actually physically starting to split apart and are being separated by vibration. As he explains it, in years to come, as you get farther and farther and farther away from people that are choosing realities that are vibrationally incompatible with what you're choosing, you will probably no longer experience them. Eventually, you will live in a world that is the world that you wished to live in, a different version of Earth that exists simultaneously with their version of Earth, but the choices they make determine the earth they experience and the choices you make determine the earth you experience because they're all existing at the same time and you're starting to go this way and they're starting to go that way and someone else is starting to go that way and that way and that way. Different earths, different experiences. So cool how it works. And I really <clears throat> understand it the way that it's broken down like this. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful for that. Sure. Uh, this idea of a participatory universe <clears throat> mm -hmm. and the creational aspects of emotion and how we create our own realities. Mm -hmm. Is it true that our inner worlds are always reflected in our outer worlds? Absolutely. Now, you may not always recognize the reflection because of other beliefs you have or filters or denials or what have you, or just not a need to necessarily see it that way. <clears throat> but yes, it can't be otherwise. It's like saying, um, can I look in a mirror and frown on my face and, and see something other than a frown on the reflection. No, the mirror doesn't have a mind of its own. Physical reality is just a mirror. So it can only reflect what you give it. That's again, the fourth law, what you put out is what you get back. It has no other choice. 
So people can wait around and look in that frown in the reflection and say, well, you know, I'm not going to smile until the reflection smiles first. Well, that'll never happen. Never. But when you smile, the mirror has no choice but to smile back because it doesn't have a mind of its own. It's just reflecting what you're doing. Now, sometimes we'll test ourselves. We may not immediately see the smile reflected. If we're making it conditional, like I'll smile if the reflection smiles back, then again, the reflection will never smile back because you're making it conditional. So people will often test themselves and say, all right, I've changed. And they're waiting around and waiting around and waiting around for something outside to change. And they're saying, oh, well, this doesn't work. Something must be wrong. That's not the way you change. The true measure of change <clears throat> is that you are the state of being you prefer to be regardless of what's going on around you. Because if you know that being in a positive state means that no matter what's happening, you're going to be able to get a benefit out of it somehow, then what difference does it make what the reality looks like? Why do you care? Because you are powerful enough to go, I don't care what happens. I don't care how it started. I don't care if even it started negatively. I don't care what anyone else's opinion is about it. I don't care what anyone else's experience is about it. If I remain in a positive state, I will get a beneficial effect from it. If nothing else, manifesting something that I neutrally, objectively don't prefer can still be used positively because if nothing else, I can look at that and go, Seeing what I don't prefer more clearly helps me see what I do prefer more clearly by contrast. Therefore, I've used what I don't prefer in a way that I prefer. And therefore, I get a benefit even from something I don't prefer. So why should anyone care exactly what things look like if you know that it's all going to serve you in a positive way? So the idea of true change is I'm going to be this positive state and I don't care what anything looks like. That's how you get the benefit. So you can't make it conditional on, well, this has to happen if I change. Because all that means is you haven't changed because you're still making it outside yourself instead of inside yourself.